What's up, people? So, um, let's talk about the Book of Boba Fett. Uh, um, I mentioned this show a lot in my other videos. You know, I would talk about how much I'm excited for it and before it came out. And I was like, man, looking forward to it because, you know, it's Boba Fett and he's going to kick a lot of butt in his own live action show. That sounds really cool. The trailer came out and imply this is going to be a much nicer Boba Fett who's going to be more civilized. And I was like, actually, I kind of like that idea. Like, I don't think I've ever seen that kind of character before, a more civilized bounty hunter who isn't in it for the money. So I was like, mm, that could be interesting. So then I'm, I wa I'm watching it, and uh, this was kind of a mess. And it's like, that's one of the best words I think to describe this movie. Like, this show. Um, like, it has two stories in the first four episodes. Then in the next two episodes, switches to a completely different story. Then we get to the finale, and it was just one of the most unsatisfying endings I've seen in a while. So, kind of crazy what a mess this was. So I knew I had to rewatch it so I could actually make a video on it because like, I need more time to collect my thoughts. Uh, so yeah, over, over last week I rewatched the show, all seven episodes, and I was hoping it would get better and sad to report that not really, this did not get better. But yeah, let's talk about the show itself. I'm just going to go through each episode so I can talk about it. So I think episodes one and two are actually pretty solid, but I'm mostly talking about the flashbacks because the flashbacks in episodes one and two, of course, we see Boa Fett get out of the Sarlacc pit after Return of the Jedi and we see him um, you know, the Jawas take the armor off of him, and then the Tusken Raiders come in and take him in as their own. And we see Boba gaining their trust and then stopping the train that the Pike Syndicate were firing at them. And then he becomes a part of their tribe. And I'll be honest, I found it really engaging. And like, there's not as much dialogue in in this in these flashbacks and. It's really well done, you know, and also the music done by, well, the themes were done by Ludwig Göransson, I think is say his name, who did The Mandalorian, but the score is done by Joseph Shirley. I hope I got that right, and yeah, both of them do a great job with the music. I found it, again, really awesome I and mean, memorable. Well, like nowhere near John Williams, but it's up there, and then... And again, it's really cool seeing Boba Fett being more civilized. Again, I like the idea of Boba being a more civilized person, like not a cold-blooded killer like the fans have built him up to be, how Darth Vader built him up to be in Empire Strikes Back, like, you know, when he told him no disintegrations. So it's like, I kind of like this. But the biggest issue with these two episodes is that the main story is so little. Like, I checked. <clears throat> I checked the runtime. Both of these episodes have more screen time on the flashbacks than the main story. Like, the supposed... The story you're supposedly supposed to care about the most. You know, where after the event of the Mandalorian, after Boba took over Jabba the Hutt's palace, he goes to Mos Espa and tries to, you know, he's telling everybody he's Daimyo, he's the leader of Tatooine, and that he's going to make the planet a better place. Like, there is so little screen time dedicated to this that I genuinely found myself not caring very much. Like, that's, that's one of the biggest issues with this show. The structure is a mess. That's... They, they, they'll focus on Boba Fett's story in Tatooine where he's 
again, trying to make the planet a better place, saying, I'm Daimyo, y'all you all must bow to me. But then all of a sudden, it, it'll just go to a flashback, and we'll just see the, the, the his backstory uh, with the Tusken Raiders, and it'll always feel for it. It's like, this is basically the same problem Eternals had, where that movie would move the plot along, but then at random points, it would just pause the story so it could flash back and do some character development. development. Like, character development is good. I get that. But you have to find a way to make it fuse with the plot. Uh, and these flashbacks don't really go well with the plot that's going along. Like, they, they, they feel really forced together. It makes me wonder why the flashbacks weren't just their own episodes. So then we get to chapters three and four, and... I kind of found myself underwhelmed with those two. Like chapter three had the flashback, which is the shortest one. I'll give it that. It spends more time in the main story. But then the Tusken Raiders all die. And I'll admit, I did feel sad. But at the same time, you do kind of know why they did it. Because, well, we got to move the plot along. And we got to... Like, it's obvious why they did it. And and then Chapter 4's flashbacks have, again, more screen time than the main story. Of course, show Boba Fett recruiting Fennec Shand after that guy killed him in Mandalorian Season 1. And then... And then he gets the Slave 1 out of... Or the Fire Spray Gunship, as they apparently call it. And they get out of the, out of the palace, and then... Look for the armor inside the Sarlacc pit for some reason. Although they do kill it in the most sick way possible. And then, yeah, it basically gets caught up with where we meet him in Mandalorian Season 2. Um, something I'm a little split about, too, where apparently the show basically tells you gunshots, like blaster shots, will slowly kill you, apparently. We all thought blaster shots will, like, instantly kill you, you know? But this show is telling us, well, no, actually, they are slow about it. You're unconscious, and then you slowly die. And I'm like, what? And then and then she gets resurrected. Fennec Shane gets resurrected. The way they resurrected her, I just thought was, I don't know, like... It's very similar to force healing when it was introduced in Rise of Skywalker. Once you introduce this idea of resurrecting people, it makes the stakes feel even lower, you know? Like, so anybody can be resurrected. And, and I, I just don't like it. Um, but then, from the main story of chapters 3 and 4, well, there's the Rancor that Boba Fett adopts, or, no, the twins, the, the twins give it to him. By the way, those twins I thought were so interesting in Chapter 2. Like, I wanted to see more of them. But then in, the, in Chapter 3, they just disappear. I'm just like, dang it, I want to see more of them. Oh, and Chris Santin is also in this. I did read some of the comics, and Chris Santin was, like, a pretty cool Wookiee bounty hunter. He even fought Chewbacca at one point, and it was kind of cool seeing him, though... I did kind of feel like they kind of downplayed his powers, like how strong he is. Um, oh, and then there's also the robot kids. You know, the those guys were kind of weird. Like, they did not belong. Like, I could see those characters on Tat or on Coruscant. Like, they, they look way too clean. Like, they do not belong on Tatooine. And. Like, the speeders also look way too colorful. Like, this is Tatooine. You know, a desert planet, you know? So, it's really odd. I don't remember much in Chapter 4 that's in the main story. I mean, I mean, Fett has that talk with the other characters, with the other aliens at the t on the table. And I'm just like, uh, okay. Um, actually, while I'm at it, something I just re remember to give credit to... Something I actually like about this show is that it remembers this is Star Wars and that there are aliens all over the place. And so not they're they're not all humans. Like 
people want more diversity in Star Wars. Well, the way you do that is have more aliens be in there, and that's great. That's something I didn't like about the sequel trilogy. There are way too many humans in the sequels. There are so many human characters that it gets to the point where the aliens feel more like background characters. Like, it's kind of ridiculous. And this show, the Bofa, has more alien characters in it. it. So yeah, then chapter four, you know, wraps up the flashbacks. Like we're all caught up, up, uh, and they tease in the music that Mando is coming in. So I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. Mando could come in and help out. So it's like, okay, so we got three more episodes left. This is the perfect opportunity to flesh out the main story a little more to help me care, right? But that's not what happens. That is, no, no, that is not what happens. Chapters 5 and 6 come in, and all of a sudden, the apparently this show wanted to tell a third story. Like, now it's about Mandalore, now it's about Din Djarin. We're basically getting Mandalorian Season 2.5 here, and... Everybody's already said it, but this is one of the most bizarre choices I've seen in Star for Star Wars since the sequel trilogy. It's like, what? Why are you... And to be honest, chapters 5 and 6 are actually my two favorite episodes of this show. I love them. Like, I love The Mandalorian. It is a fantastic show. And Din Djarin's story is great. And that's why when he showed up, it's like, oh, that's cool. And they still, he has a really well-written story that they have in this show as well. Like, continuing where he left off after Mandalorian Season 2. You know, we see him with the Darksaber. He actually oh, hurts himself. Well, you know, that's actually pretty realistic since he's not Force-sensitive. And we'd all be doing that if we had a lightsaber. And then he goes back to the Armorer or where there's only a few Mandalorians of, of his kind left, and they find out that, you know, he removed his helmet, and he gets banished Ish, and I'm not sure if we're going to see the Armorer ever again, or Paz Vizsla, which he's played by Jon Favreau. That's the only way I know, the only reason I know his name. Um, so then he goes back to Tatooine, and, you know, he gets an N1 Starfighter, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's something else, too. The show, when during the Boa Fett flashbacks, the show also flashbacks to Attack of the Clones. Like, it acknowledges that the prequels are canon. That's another thing I love. The sequel trilogy will like, try to do their best to ignore the prequels. I'm, I'm not even sure Anakin's name is mentioned. Like, oh, oh, you know, he's the guy who saved the galaxy by throwing the Emperor down a reactor shaft. Who cares about him? Like, so disrespectful. But this show, you know, it acknowledges, even if some people don't like him, the prequels are canon. And again, I really respect that when they flash back to Boa Fett as a young clone and his father, Django. And this show does the same thing where Boa Fla Mando flies an N1 Starfighter or, uh, from Phantom Menace. Like, he even flies through the same canyon that Anakin drove through in his pod racer all those all those years ago and then he goes to meet Grogu and then Luke and Ahsoka also show up which honestly it's making me think wow who else is going to show up in Ahsoka now since these are some of those unexpected appearances I've ever seen in like wasn't a show called Book of Boba Fett but chapter 6 is really good too I mean, it's a bad Boba Fett episode, but as an episode on its own, I freaking love it. You know, we see Mando going to the planet where Luke's training Grogu, and he really wants to see him, but he has to accept maybe he won't see him anymore. And you know, he's talking with Ahsoka, and Luke was also training Grogu, even though I kind of liked Luke's story in Last Jedi. I thought it's an, it's an interesting idea. This is the Luke I wanted to see. You know, him training younglings after learning 
how to become a Jedi after the original trilogy. This is a Luke I wanted to see. We all wanted to see this Luke. And the CGI on him is pretty good too. Like this is the first time Star Wars has nailed a CGI face after the failure of Luke at the end of Mando season two and Tarkin and Leia and Rogue One. So then, oh, again, also, I, I know I'm bashing the sequel trilogy way too much. I know that. But another thing that this show does really well is the training where we actually see Grogu train. Or I actually, I guess Luke kind of mentions he's more like reminding him of what his training was. But what did Rey train? Like, the more I thought about Rey, she never trained. You know, she fights Ben Solo in Force Awakens and beats him. Even if Ben was injured, that makes no sense for me. I just can't accept she would do that, even if Ben is injured. And then Last Jedi, what training does she do? No, really, what does she do? Luke gives her a couple history lessons and, you know, does a Force Vision thing. Like, what does she learn? And then she's suddenly all powerful, and again, it feels unnatural, like we're skipping some stuff. Like Rise of Skywalker, I'll admit, did show her training, but it's like, no, 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 you're too little, too late, guys. Like, too late. Hey. Hey, so, back to Boa Fett, you know, Grogu's training, and... And then, of course, you know, there's that moment where Mando has the chainmail armor, or made from Beskar that he wants to give to Grogu. And something I also really like, Luke gives Grogu the choice. It's like, if you if you subscribe to Thor Skywalker, you should. He talks, does a couple of videos. He did a couple of videos talking about why this is actually pretty good. Uh, Luke giving Grogu the choice. Like, unlike Anakin, who just who just kind of training, and this, and... He tried to do both, you know. Oh, he tried to be a Jedi, but also be with Padme. And, and because of that, he ended up turning into Darth Vader and destroying the Jedi Order. But this time, Grogu has the choice before he fully commits to the Jedi. Like, Luke knows his heart isn't entirely in it. And, so, and knows he has grown an attachment to Din Djarin. So it gives him the choice to is to back away from this because it, it is his choice um it's a little weird that luke has yoda's lightsaber but oh well and i haven't even gotten to cad bane in this holy cap cow cad bane that is like the one character who showed up in this and i'm like okay that actually makes sense to show up in a boba fett show you know and they even got the same voice actor too from clone wars Corey burton I've heard some people talk about his look being not like his design in Clone Wars. And I'm I'm just kind of like, I don't care. That looks like Cad Bane to me. Like, Ahsoka's look isn't entirely accurate, but I don't know. I, I don't, like It's hard to do cartoon to, to live action anyway, so I just kind of accept it's not going to be perfect, you know? Um. So, yeah, I love the chapters 5 and 6. Again, again, they're not good episodes of Boba Fett, technically, because they do take screen time away from his story, and they have nothing to do with it. But if I look, watch these episodes on their own, I loved them. The finale, on the other hand, was one of the most underwhelming finales I've seen since... Episode, uh, I, I, I really need to stop bashing on the sequel trilogy, but since episode 9. Um, whoo, this finale, like... Okay, again, the problem with chapters 1 through 4 was that they spent so much time on the flashbacks of Boa Fett that they gave little screen time to the main story about Boa Fett trying to make Tatooine a better place. Then chapters 5 and 6 took the story away from that even further. So now you get to the finale, and it's a mess, because you're like, why should I care? Like, he's grown an attachment to the people of Mos Espa. He really wants the Pike Syndicate to stop getting spiced through here. But the entire time I'm watching this episode, I'm just kind of like, I don't know why I was supposed to care. You guys didn't really give me a reason to care what's happening. 
it is an enjoyable episode. Like, this episode has cool moments, you know? Like, you know, seeing Boba and Mando work together to fight off the Pike Syndicates was pretty, was pretty sick. And the Rancor coming in and fighting off those giant droids is pretty cool. Like, it is kind of like X-Men The Last Stand, where there are good moments in this that I'm like, okay, that was worth it. But as an overall package, it just does not come together. And also, Boba and Bane's rivalry was off. Like, they act, they, they, they play this off like apparently they've had a rivalry for years. Like, this has been so built up. But not really, no. The only time these characters have interacted beforehand, well, maybe not even, but it was, it was in that one Clone Wars episode when they're in the prison and Bane is, Bane told Boba to go distract at the prison prisoners to do a fight so Bane and this other guy can escape. Like, that's pretty much the only time I can think of they ever interacted. Like, yeah, they they did have that uh, arc planned where they would have shown Boba finally putting on the Mandalorian armor for the first time and having a fight with Cad Bane where he kills him and Bane puts the dent in his helmet. Like, that was originally planned, yes, but... They never made it, so it's not even canon. At least not yet. So, this rivalry feels... It, it wasn't well built. Just like the whole finale itself, this rivalry was not well built up. So then the, the two fight, and then Boba kills him. I don't know, like, I should... I, I wanted to feel satisfied. I wanted to go, oh, yes, that's the perfect way for Bane to go out. But instead, I'm just kind of thinking, ah, like that just doesn't feel satisfying. Like, 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 I don't know. Just, I, again, this was not well built up to. So Bane dies. And I'm just kind of like, I guess that's the end of it. Like, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I hope they could, maybe. If, Maybe Boba shows up in Bad Batch season two, and they flesh out their story a little better. But then I thought, then I'm like, oh wait, no, they should have had this happen before Bo Book of Boba Fett came out. So it's like too late, guys. Like, like this was this was not again. This is not well done. And then there's also Grogu's choice, you know. Again, that decision about will he choose Luke or Mando was discussed for a week. People were discussing, like, oh, which, which, what is he going to do? Like, I thought, like, I, I remember thinking about it, too. Uh, it, was, it was basically, like, people discussing Force Awakens. Like, what could happen in Episode 8? Hey, at least we only had one week instead of two years. And, like... Me, personally, I kind of wanted Grogu to choose Luke because I knew that would make the ending of Mandalorian Season 2 kind of feel like we just did all that for nothing. That goodbye doesn't feel that sad anymore. So then the episode comes in and we the, the, the decision is confirmed. Grogu chose Mando. He has the chainmail arm, the Beskar arm, our armor on him and uh, and Luke just sends him back to Tatooine and I'm just like okay I'm kind of split on this okay a way I like it is that again I talked about it again earlier but again and Grogu wasn't entirely into Jedi training so oh, and if he tr if he if he, he keeps going to Mando, keeps thinking about him, he won't be able to fulfill the Jedi training. And Luke realizes this, and so gives him the choice to fully let go of Mando or go back to him. And I like that. That is good storytelling. But at the same time, there are two issues. First of all, it's way too early. Like, this is way too early. Like, I feel like we should have had Mandalorian Season 3 before this happened. And speaking of, 
why is it happening in this show? Why is it happening in the Book of Boba Fett? Wouldn't you, again, save this for Mandalorian Season 3? Like, I have no idea why this would happen in this show, but here it is. So now Grogu can be back for Mando Season 3. And yeah, you do get the feeling this was a studio decision. Like, Disney knew how profitable Grogu is. Like, the amount of toys they've sold. So they're like, no, no, you got to put him back in. You got to put him back in. So y you do feel that studio decision behind it. But, I mean, I kind of like the decision. Like, Favreau and Filoni were thinking about how this was going to work. But, again, not only was this way too early to do it, this is the wrong show to do it in. And, yeah, just... I don't know, like, I saw them reunite, and I was like, man, I should feel happy, but instead I just feel like, I just feel, feel like, man, this was not, that's the problem with the whole finale, but again, this is not well built up to, oh, and, oh, and also Grogu stole Boba's thunder when he calms down the Rancor, I don't know, I was just kind of thinking, why couldn't you just have Boba do that, and, and then you, again, have Boba walk through the town with Fennec Shan after the battle's over. And, you know, he's, um, you know, happy. Yay, yay, we're all safe. Like, I'm the new Daimyo. And once again, this is not well built up to, to the point where I should feel happy that this is all over. But instead, I'm just kind of like, oh, I guess this is happening too. Like, I said this I have already said it a lot, but the biggest problem with this finale is that it was not well built up to, and as a result, I just kind of found it really underwhelming. Yeah, that's the Book of Boba Fett for me. Like, I, man, this was honestly kind of disappointing. It's like, I was excited for this. I wanted to see Boba Fett's story, but then it wasn't developed well, except for the flashbacks. And then Mando season 2.5, I guess, is in here. And yeah, this was kind of a messy show. But at the same time, I did really enjoy it. This is a, I think this show is really enjoyable. Oh, like, again, there are lots of parts I enjoyed. And again, chapters 5 and 6 are my favorite episodes, even though, again, I acknowledge they do not belong in this show. And. It's really, an, and I'll even watch it again. Like, it, I, I, I rewatched Mandalorian every few couple months, and yeah, I, I will. Now I'm going to put this in here since it does continue Mando's story. So, yeah, if there's a movie I can compare this to, it would be Spider Man 3, where it's not a good movie, and it ha has some objective flaws that hold it back. But at the same time, I do enjoy it. I, I do think it has some good stuff to offer that make it worth it. And, I'll, and I still rewatch it whenever I rewatch the first two movies as well. That's the Book of Boba Fett for me in a nutshell. Now, not a good show. It's not. And far from as good as The Mandalorian. And yeah, it has some real objective structure problems. But it is still enjoyable. I'll, uh, and I'm still glad I saw it. Uh, even, even, again, I do acknowledge the flaws. And, yeah, it's the Book of Boa Fett for me. Next we have Obi-Wan Kenobi coming on May 25th. And not, 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 I, I won't talk about it here because there's a lot to talk about for that. I'll just say I hope they get this right. I just really really hope they get it right so pace